Hey everybody, it's Ken Pooch Van Druten here with you, and of course, my partner in crime there, Chris Raybold. What's going on, everybody? How you doing, Chris? How you feeling today? Good, good. Yeah. I feel pretty good today. It's uh, it's an interesting world we live in now with this uh, this COVID thing. It's turning me into uh, like a, an OCD. I think after this thing, I'm like never gonna hug anybody and never gonna shake their hand ever again the notion of, of shaking hands <laughs> is pretty intense it's like seriously turned me into this weird bugaphobe you know what i mean it's like i, I know i don't know i don't know uh but um yeah i mean it's uh luckily we have uh this thing that we can keep doing and hopefully people are digging it um yeah um <clears throat> so uh, we've been talking a lot about drums, which is cool, and that's always you know kick drum is input number one. So it seems like we've been, <laughs> it seems like we have uh, we've started uh, where most people uh, start. Yeah. Um, but I always say this to people, um, you know, the most important thing in any mix uh, is the vocal. Um, you know, when I first started, um, I was asking my friends to come to shows and like critique my mixes because I wanted opinions. And these were mm -hmm. friends of mine that were not musicians. Like, you know, one of them was my best friend who's grown up. He's a lawyer, you know, um, and it's probably a better place to source that sort of opinion from, <laughs> yeah. really, you know? No, totally. And that's what I, I did that on purpose. I was like, I want somebody that doesn't know about music to come to my show and tell me what they liked about my mix. And I will tell you a hundred percent of those answers were, I liked that I could hear the vocal the entire time, or I liked that I understood the vocal or didn't under, I hated that I couldn't understand the vocal. It was always, mm -hmm. always comments about the vocal. Um, mm -hmm. And so kind of early on in my career that established uh, that vocals were pretty important. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, so I always tell people, you know, it's not only about um, the, the song and hearing the vocalist, hearing every little detail of the vocalist during the song, but it's also in between songs. Um, so I thought today maybe we could talk a little bit about um, vocal chain and, and, um, Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. Speak to that a little bit. Maybe uh, either talk about your vocal chain or talk about what your philosophy is with vocal. Mm -hmm. oh, man, that's so interesting that you brought up the the speaking parts between songs, because so often if it's a person who's very verbal with the crowd, uh, man, that could be the hardest part of the night. Oh, man. It's like juggling the speaking to the you know oh, that's such that can that could be such a pain uh let's see vocal well just strictly nuts and bolts which which i know is it's fun to talk about and it's interesting to hear too about what we all do for myself i've kind of had to change when it was all when i went through the period where i was only in the box or when i still do things only in the box there it's pretty cool if you know because you can easily manipulate the chain you want it um when I do things that are around the box, it's both in the box and out of the box, I can't always put the elements, like there might be a few analog elements I like, but I wish I could actually put after some of the plug-in elements, but you can't, so you, you kind of have to commit. So that being said, in my ideal world, a chain for a vocal would look something like this. It would be, uh, first of all, I use the high pass on the console and not, and basically only on the console because my thought is if that plugin server ever goes down, the plugins take a shit, whatever happens, I don't want that vocal to take off in the house. That's awesome. So, That's exactly, I, yeah. I have that same thought you process. you do that? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. High pass filtering One, and low pass filtering is happening on the console. Yes, for sure. Just for safety's sake, you know? So it goes uh, high pass, then it would go usually into that's where I, I'll do a little bit of EQ there. Usually just some subtractive stuff to clean it up. Uh, from there, I'll hit either a dynamic EQ or a multi-band, or I'll hit that thing that almost everyone uses now. I do that before compression. I do it with the idea of let's shape this thing the way we want it, then let it hit the compressor. So then after that compressor, I'll add some EQ. Um, as big of a 
uh, a uh, saturation junkie as I am, I've kind of quit using it on vocals here as of late. I just thought I thought about that before we before we spoke today because I'm like, I bet we do vocal stuff. Uh, God, I haven't done that in a while, and I know I should. You know, one could argue I do by some some of the things that I choose. Like if it's a plug-in, it's an 1176 uh, to give it that bright excitement kind of distortion stuff. Right. If it's out of the box, which I'll talk about next, it's a distressor that's I'm lighting it up pretty good. So. So that's the way the chain would would look um, really quickly, because I do like to have some stuff, some hardware stuff. What I do now is I've always. Oh, sorry. There's a DS or after the compressor. Uh, I used to always DS on the front end. Then I became sort of hip to the fact, and this is not that long ago, um, that you know what? P compression really does exacerbate sibilance in many cases. My mind is, you know, DSing is a, um, it's like a housekeeping thing. So it's not so much a creative thing. So I put that on the front end always of the compressor to like shape. Anyway, then I started using it more after. <clears throat> now, because the way my hardware chain goes, it is the Neve 5045, which is, you know, now there's a host of options with those, but what a godsend. Oh, man. Um, and the main person I use it on, uh, is is Bruno. I mean, I use it on everybody, but when I say use it on, I play it with him. Right. Like I, when he, he can get really far away, he can do a ballad, he can do this, you know. So I'll turn it on and off and I worry those switches are going to fail, but I want to be able to see it. <laughs> so this is the way I think of it. It goes from that thing into uh, almost always a distressor that on the end of the distressor is a Empirical Labs Duresser. You ever use those? No, I haven't. What's that like? It's, they are almost too strong of a DSR. I mean, it's devastating. There is no, uh, you, you only need to hit it lightly. Huh. And the S's are gone, S's T, what, anything up there, gone, gone, gone. And what's cool about it, you can use it where it is frequency dependent, or you can use it where it's frequency independent. It just looks at the overall signal coming in and says with this signal, whether it's right. a neg negative two full scale or negative 40, Right. What's the content? It, right. it works on that principle. So that's at the end. So now I'm putting the DSer before. If I also, if I use that chain and a plug-in chain, the plug-in chain is usually only just another compressor and an EQ. But now suddenly I've moved that DSer kind of in the wrong order than what I'm like Yeah, it. right. Totally. But what a good problem to have. You <laughs> know, oh, geez. You know? Yeah, right. So. So anyway, I, uh, I've started to think about it like this. My hardware chain is though someone were tracking the vocal. Okay. And so they didn't track with, and most people don't track with dynamic EQ or multiband compression. Right. So the way, this is the way I've kind of rectified it in my head. Someone knows this is a sibilant singer that they tracked with this on the way in. And then I'm going to treat it with something else after it, just like you would in a studio setting. So after that would come now, I don't need... And now I might use another compressor, maybe just for color, and then an EQ, and it's usually like a Neve type thing for some color too. So that's kind of my standard thing. Cool. And um, so, for instance, for me, my vocal chain is kind of the thing uh, of all the instruments that changes from artist to artist the most. Like, you mm -hmm. know, drums are like pretty standard. <laughs> Um, depending on what the kit sounds like, but pretty much I'm using the same kind of plugins for individual channels. But when we're talking about vocals for me, I have the same kind of chain, but a lot of times it's different plugins. Is that true for you or you like stay totally stay with the same ones? I, the only, uh, and I was trying to think back to your session. I keep referring back to the time that we kind of scared, shared sessions. And I remember there was, some, there was some interesting stuff in there that I literally didn't even know how to use. And I had to just turn off. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> you had some cool shit. But I, uh, I, on my plugins, you know what? I go between 1176 blue stripes. It's yep. everybody that makes one has a cool one. They're always brighter. Yep. Uh, and an LA-2A. Cool. And those are awesome. And I use those as well on vocals. Um, the interesting mm -hmm. thing, you know, it's so funny. It's like we both talk about, I do mostly do all things in the box. Um, as you know, you definitely, you know, do some things analog wise. Um, I, I love the result that you get out of that. But the, 
the chain is very similar. I'm just keeping it all mm -hmm. in the box. Um, from mm -hmm. for my uh, chain, I'm very much the same way in regards to high pass, low pass filtering um, at the top. Um, you know, it's something to point out. I do um, actually pretty good amount of low pass filtering on vocals. Like I will literally take mm -hmm. that low pass filter right up to the point where it's the top of their sibilance and their stuff. Cause I'm trying to get mm -hmm. rid of all the other crap that's in the room. It's the most hot yeah. microphone. So you want to get rid of all the cymbal splash that's on the stage and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, uh, it's a thing that most people, um, maybe don't think about or don't use, which is low pass filtering. You know, high pass mm. filtering is like one of the most important things, but low pass filtering is, it can be totally your friend. You will find, and I think it's true for you, you'll find a lot of low pass filtering on various channels on my inputs. Um, but vocals, especially, um, now what I do is I have the same thinking process that you do. I um I use that low pass filter but then on the end of a vocal I kind of manufacture some sparkly mm. bits. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So it's like a tracked mm -hmm. vocal that where that information is being removed but then mm. on the end of the vocal I'm actually boosting some EQ in the mm -hmm. super high sparkly bits to try to get that enunciation stuff that happens um, mm -hmm. even though it's low past, if that makes right. some sense, yeah, it, that's different than leaving the low pass filter out and, and not boosting the high end of a yes. vocal. It's a different right. sound. It's a, it's yeah. a less mastered kind of mm -hmm. sound. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, I, that's, that's it. That's where it starts. That's always on the console. Um, I leave the console EQ alone and treat it as an emergency EQ. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, a day-to-day -day thing, it's mostly always flat, but if I show up somewhere and we're doing a festival and all of a sudden the uh, vocalist can literally stand in front of a stack of 16 K1, um, right. Yeah. Then, then the, ch <laughs> <laughs> which we all yeah. know has happened. Yeah. Um, then yeah. the channel vocal or the channel EQ is the, that's where I run to is the strip. Um, yeah. so that, that pretty much remains flat. Um, so then my next thing in the chain is almost always, um, a DSer, just like you. I like the DSer at the front of stuff. Um, lately I've been using, there's a plugin by Waves called Sibilance. Um, mm -hmm. and it is, uh, frequency dependent and also threshold dependent. So you can adjust, um, you know, how much of that sibilance you want to duck, obviously, uh, as well as what frequency to do that and the cue of it. Um, and it's really, mm -hmm. it's super intelligent. Um, and, and make sure if in the live world, guys, there's two versions, there's sibilance and there's sibilance live. And Sibilance Live is um, low latency version of the regular Sibilance because it's actually a look ahead plugin. So it's it's looking at Sibilance stuff and deciding where to duck. So make sure that um, let's go off on a tangent on that just a little bit. Let's talk about latency and and yeah. look and look yeah. ahead plugins. Sorry guys, we'll come back to my mm -hmm. my strip and my my chain here in a minute, but I just want to point out. Um, and a lot of people don't know this, like what a look ahead plugin is. Okay. Um, a look ahead plugin is, um, a, a plugin where information is coming along and the plugin itself, um, is delayed by a few samples or, a few, you know, even whatever, you know, milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Um, because what it does is looks ahead at the signal. And it sees a signal coming along. It sees that there's large amplitude or low amplitude before it gets to the plug-in, right? It's seeing that, seeing that there's high amplitude and low amplitude and makes the decision as to compress or expand when the signal gets there, okay? So it's really, it's like a smart version of a compressor or expander. Um, and as opposed to an analog version of that would be, here comes the signal, the amplitude is here, and it has to make a split second decision about what to do with it. 
Mm-hmm. With look ahead, it is, here's the plugin. It sees the amplitude. It says, oh, look, there's a huge spike coming. And when it gets to me, I'm going to be right on it. I'm going to definitely compress it. All right. And that's called look ahead. But think about what it has to do. It, ha- it has to be a fair amount of latency for that to work, right? Because it's always looking ahead. It makes this plugin be a little bit later. So pay attention. Those of you that use a lot of plugins, play, pay attention to the lugin, the uh, <laughs> lugins, the plugins, <laughs> the plugins that you're choosing and learn about whether or not they are a look ahead plugin and learn about whether or not they have tons of latency. Because think about that. If you all of a sudden put six plugins that are all look ahead and all especially in monitors. Oh man, especially in monitors. Yeah. Yeah. Four milliseconds and you're screwed, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, anything above, well, I think it, you start to feel it at about three milliseconds, but four milliseconds for sure, you know, the, the drummer will be hitting a snare drum and be like, what, what is, you know, mm-hmm. kak, kak, you know, going, what is wrong, mm-hmm. you know? Um, mm-hmm. So latency is important when you're talking about plugins. Um, so pay attention to the plugins you're choosing. I, basically choose plugins uh, in my chain, especially like for vocal, where one of those plugins is either a look ahead or something that has a bunch of latency. I don't want to get um, too far uh, into you know having six plugins that have all kinds of latency in them. Mm-hmm. Now, having said that, you made a really good point, Chris. Monitors is really where you have to watch out for that. Yeah, um, it really is two different we're on two different fields when it comes to what we can get away with in the time domain. Totally. And actually, yeah, totally. Um, And actually I find uh, that sometimes having specifically having some latency in the lead vocal makes your lead vocal pop in your mix, Uh, which is, I can see that, which is an interesting thing. So actually adding latency when we're talking about front of house, sometimes Mm -hmm. I've noticed uh, it actually helps that vocal pop, you know? Um, so, but I, I just think that people should be aware of like what a look ahead plugin is and also why that is and why there's latency, you know, there's all those kind of issues. So mm-hmm. sorry to travel down that rabbit hole. No, that's cool. That's what this is for. That's perfect. <laughs> um, uh, uh, let me, I'll go Did back. You finish I- your vocal chain. No, I didn't yet. That's why I, I'll go back to that. I feel like I'm all I'm doing is I am yeah, talking, yeah. but you <laughs> you should be talking. I love it. No, okay. it's great. All right. Great. Well, anyway, okay. I'll finish my vocal um, path. So for me, it, remember, it's high pass, low pass on the console. Uh, first plugin in the chain is usually uh, a deesser, which is sibilance. Um, the the second one in my chain um, is. The uh, the plug-in version of the 5045, uh, which is called Primary Source Expander. Um, mm. I love so, that one. Yeah, same thing. It's the same deal that more you're features. using. Same features. Mm. Uh, it's li- more actually more features with the oh yeah the high yeah yeah low pass in it yeah totally control yeah. of it is is a little bit more. Um, mm-hmm. I totally get what you're saying about having control quickly for that specific plugin. Um, I've I've had to train myself to make that plugin be a hot plugin and yeah. have like, I'll let my mouse hover over that. Or if it's a touch screen, I put it right in a place where I can just reach for it. Cause That's I'm the cool. same way. I like to adjust that threshold, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, but um, that plugin single handedly, I mean, I don't know about you, but in that the whole Justin Bieber thing that we handed off to each other, oh, God. Um, yeah. I wouldn't have been able to survive without that plan. No, no, no. way. No. Um, there Not were in front of the thrust, and oh my God, yeah, you know, dude, was, we got uh, to stadiums later on in that tour where they had an automation piece that mm-hmm. was sixty feet up and eighty <laughs> feet in front of the PA. So where so he's in, he's in the long throw. He's in the stuff oh, that I'm is so designed. Sorry. It's designed. <laughs> it's designed to throw bullet, you know, bullet yeah. high end yeah. out at the top seats, oh. and he's standing in it. And I'm like, this oh, is this is insane. Cool. And for sure, had I not had that tool, either the 5045 or the PSE, I would have been fired in mm-hmm. a second. 
not yeah. a chance I would and have survived. And you know what? All right. Here's a tangent. Yep. Um, with, with regards to that and with regards to we talk about artists uh, that are on a thrust, which to us are very common. It's virtually everyone. No yep. one wants to stay on stage anymore. Um, but it's also applicable to like someone in a club where the, you know, the mains are here and the person's <laughs> routinely dipping out in front. But not only is that uh, that form of gating um, uh, noise reduction, uh, not only is it important for, on, on a feedback level, which is there's nothing when you talk about you ask your friends to come and tell you what they like about the mix and you chose like the lawyer dude, that's perfect. And to the to the to the lay person or the casual listener, nothing is more synonymous with bad audio than than feedback. Yep. You know, every movie setup where the person awkwardly walks to the mic begins with feed. I mean, everyone <laughs> knows feedback's yeah, bad. Totally. <laughs> so anyway, feedback is our big enemy. But what what that also does when that when someone is in front of the mix like that all the time is you can have the most slamming mix in the world. But when you open up the hottest input on the stage and it starts mixing with that, I mean, all, everything goes backwards. It just totally. it, it just wrecks the mix. So it's it's people think that well that's just for feedback reasons. It, it, it not not only you know, um, it and if it's someone that's in the you know course with, go ahead, go ahead, sir. Nah, that was that was that was the, the crux of the thought. It it completely cleans up your mix. Like um, I have done master classes before where I have that's like an exercise. We'll put the vocal where we think it should be and then pop that thing out and pop it back in and you watch it, a whole room of sixty people go. Whoa, like 60 yeah. people all thinking, 60 engineers all going, I'm definitely going to use that plugin. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you what, what's tough about it, though, if I can real quick. Yeah, sure. Think, does, the, does the PSC have a, the Neve has, uh, it can either sense peak or RMS. I don't think the PSC has that on nope. it, does it? It does no. not. So here's the bummer. Well, there's a few bummers about those units. Um, I wish there was a, a lot of times adjustable attack and release on all of them. But I think it has to do with the way that circuitry works, which I want to reconfirm. I have it correctly in my head before I spout it out here and people repeat me and I'm wrong, but, um, whatever, um, if you're wrong, yeah. people will let you know anyway, but you know, totally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they will. So, uh, but, but, but with those units, um, if someone like I can get away with it on a, not just a soft singer, but someone who doesn't have great mic technique. I can get away with it, but it's touchy. That's like true. It, will, it it clips. It no matter how you have it set, it clips the transient. Now the best way to get it, I always keep mine in RMS mode. Um, however, Peak will provide you ultimately with a quicker, and when that person comes on, it'll grab it quicker. But when you're sensing it to look to 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 be uh looking in peak mode you will also make it more sensitive to the transient response of a snare that's right so now it's now it's opening more while it might be behaving better for the vocally now it's opening all the damn time so there's yeah, this right. fine line between what's the vocalist doing and how do i handle that with the time constants provided on those yeah um i mean that is always the problem right people start experimenting with us and they say oh man it's amazing you know great vocal but if you've got a vocalist that has any sort of vocal technique or something that's really hard you know i did mm -hmm. alanis more set for a long time and dude she'll go from screaming in it to all the mm -hmm. way down almost by her waist and yeah. so pse really didn't kind of work in that you know what i mean there was mm -hmm. it just there was too much dynamic range change when she range change when she would get it all the way down by her waist you know then the pse is an opening right you'd have to set the threshold right. so low that the rest it of the matter. stuff yeah it wouldn't matter the stuff on stage yeah so obviously you can't use it in every situation um but mm -hmm. but when you can i think at least with the plugin, and I, I know that it was modeled after the 5045, so I would assume it is the same way. It, mm -hmm. I know it's a specific, they don't give you control over it, but is it, its threshold is EQ sp uh, scope specific on vocal. So mm -hmm. wherever that is, I don't know where it's centered, like say it's 1.6 or something, you know what I mean? Right. It's like 
the threshold is really designed only to open when it's seeing that particular kind of frequency. And so that's why it works so well with vocal is it's kind of focused on vocal EQ threshold, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, it is phenomenal. So I used it on Alicia recently, <clears throat> who you have no problem getting level out of. It was right on it. And it was it was just phenomenal. And I never had to look at it. Even her speaking would oh, open so it. So great. Zero problem. When so there's a singer like, like that. Yeah. When there's oh, a singer like God. that, there's nothing better. It's like, oh man, that's the way. Yeah. I could do whatever I wanted with effects or anything, you know? So it was, yeah. it was great. That was cool. That's what's so funny about it is that it is a, it's a tool for when you're in trouble, right? It helps you with any sort of like mm -hmm. feedback issues with the singer. Um, but it's also a tool for when you have the best singer in the world. Um, it's kind of, you know, global stuff. I would say like, except for Alanis Morissette because of that one situation, I used, I've used PSC since it came out on everything. Mm -hmm. And before that I was using the 5045. So it's, it's, it is yeah. an integral. It will always be in my vocal chain, you know. Same here. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, then after that, uh, man, it changes a lot for me. I am that guy that keeps like poking around at different stuff. Um, I think the only other plugin that is pretty much there all the time for me is C6, um, you know, mm -hmm. dynamic EQ. Um, lately, Lately, I've been doing C6 and F6, which is dynamic EQ and also mm -hmm. uh, dynamic compression. And they're two totally different things. Um, they are different. I don't, I don't think that's crazy at all. Like, I understand the logic behind that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've been kind of utilizing both things, and, and um, <laughs> it seems to work well for me. Um, so like for instance uh, right now you know just only because i'm it's the band i'm working with you know iron maiden um bruce's vocal is that i think pse f6 c6 um i'm treating the f6 and c6 i'm using as eq first then dynamically after that so i'm actually shaping mm -hmm. the vocal using those two plugins as if they were kind of eq i'm not using an, a, an eq plugin per se um, mm -hmm. I'm using the dynamic part of that. Um, and, uh, that's my chain, but other, I mean, I, I, you know, a lot of other places I've used, um, I love, uh, Shep's Omni channel. Um, that thing's cool. That I've only used it on bass. We started yeah. talking about this the other day. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That thing's cool. Uh, great sounding plugin and so diverse. Um, it's, it's a big DSP eater though. So, um and and has a fair amount of latency um so i would choose it if i were going after specifically something that i needed for a vocal um and then my other two are always you know overall compression like if i need something in addition to the um the c6 or the f6 my overall compression is same thing 1176 um, I actually like the blackface 1176 um, as opposed mm -hmm. to blue uh, and LA2A. Um, uh, you know, LA2A was like, even when I was working in the studio, that was like the go-to analog piece in the studio, right? You know, it was like, oh yeah, I put the vocal through that. Um, so it always makes sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. So, all right, I'll shut up. That's my vocal chain. <laughs> you know uh, what I just thought about? I guess, you know what, I didn't say anything about specifics real quick on mine for the, so I, I like the F6. I've used it some. I still go to the C6 a lot. Yep. Um, and of course, before that, the C4. Uh, but, um, and then if it's UA, so if it's in the box, uh, if, if it's live rack based, which it usually, it always is now, is, um, well, no, not always, but usually when I have my full rig, that's the the only offering that works. A live rack currently is the, uh, Sony Oxford Dynamic EQ. Oh, okay, cool. So I'll use that, and the chain is usually that, uh, the Re Revision A, which is the Blue Stripe 1176, and then the 1084. Um, or I just went blank. It's 1084, or 1081. I'm not sure. Whatever the four band uh, classic knee uh, EQ is, then it's right. that. Right. Uh, anyway, uh, and so then in waves, it's the it's the CLA 76. It's usually the I use a good old Renaissance EQ on the way in. I'm just used cool. to it. It's just for, it's just for cleanup. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, 
Yeah. And then the, the VEQ4 after that um, with the C6 before the compression. So uh, That's all definitely yeah. good stuff. Um, I forgot about, too, if you get into um, the new Digico quantum stuff like Spice Rack, uh, there's a new oh, yeah. uh, dynamic EQ in that. Uh, that I've started to mess around. I started to mess around be right before this, the world went crazy. Um, I was uh, mm -hmm. mixing some virtual playback and was messing around with it. And it's a pretty awesome little dynamic EQ as well. Um, I'm excited about their new multiband compressor within, I guess it's within Spice Rack where you can choose. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. The, with the properly sloped knee on the, yes, I've been waiting for that for years. I'm looking forward. That will save me a plug-in. If that does what... It should. That that will save me a plug in there. It um, I, it's interesting. I put it on. I was listening to Iron Maiden through it, virtual playback, and I added it into addition of what I had else going on, which was F six and C six, and I added that on the very end of it, the Spice Rack Digico version of it, um, and it's, it was really interesting what it did. It like. Uh, uh, it was helpful. I think it was a it was a good mm -hmm. addition. I didn't take. I suppose I could maybe take the C six away and use it in its place. But even just putting it in addition to what I had was turned into something pretty good. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so then the question. So that's that's kind of the input channel, right? You know, for mm -hmm. both of us. Um, I mean, like I said, my, I don't know, I, I try different things and, and it really depends on the vocalist. Um, you know, uh, some things are less, I've had a vocalist, uh, where I've actually had two C6s in line because I needed, um, mm. I needed dynamic compression to happen and expansion to happen because their vocal mm. had different qualities to it like there was a low end part of their vocal and there was a high end part of the vocal and the c6 wasn't able to kind of one c6 wasn't able to grab all of that so i, I had mm -hmm. a c6 kind of acting like a c4 with two extra bands which is what it is and then the second c6 was the c4 part bypassed and just using the extra two bands Right. As dynamic compression. So it was really giving me four sweepable mm -hmm. bands mm -hmm. along with, um, you know, a, a kind of a C4 working in conjunction. Um, so like, as I, you know, there's no set in stone. That's kind of what I've done. Um, I didn't mention now that you, when you were saying that, and I was thinking to myself, just like you're doing now with the C6 and the F6, because it's a multi-band. That's exactly coupled right. with, uh, And I didn't mention that. And honestly, if you look at my Bruno rack, it's still there. Um, so I will oftentimes, but I have found and known over the years that it also just by being in line colors the sound, but, um, I'll still have an old, uh, BSS 901 and I'm okay with either version one or version two. I know they sound different, but, um, I'll still keep those sometimes in line just so I can also play it. If it's someone that I, those, I know where they go in certain songs. Totally. Um, I'll do that. I can tell you this. If I make up my mind that I'm not using it, I will take it out of the audio path altogether. Right. Um, Cause to me, it does kind of brown the sound. It has. Bit. Yeah. It has a sound quality to it for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it, um, especially I notice it in the newer PAs that have all the super high sparkly bits. It kind of, changes makes the top end kind of wanky for me yep. the 901 just sitting there like not even doing anything just sitting there because i think when they designed that piece of hardware they weren't thinking about hey we're gonna you know we're gonna have these pas that are replicating those kind of frequencies um yeah but um yeah man um so what about like uh what are some tips and tricks or whatever that you use to get your vocal to pop through your mix? Like what is, you know, outside of the input channel, what are some things that you do either bus compression or whatever uh, to make the vocal mm -hmm. be on top of everything else? Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm, for some reason, I just got really excited when you asked that because that's a great question and I didn't see it coming. <laughs> um, or say, or at least I didn't expect my mind to go where it went when you when you asked it. In the sense that it's actually not a mix thing, although I'll speak to that too to answer the question. But for me, the key to getting a vocal out on top, forget of even over the mix, but in a live environment, is confidence in 
uh, and knowing the reality of the situation with your PA. Okay. You know, that to me is where it starts. So if you've got, if it's a, and you, you'll know yours, you, if you have a strong vocalist who's right on it, who's upstage at the PA and it's good, you don't have anything to worry about. But totally. if you've got somebody that's mobile, they're in front of the system, if the system's always back, if they're on a thrust or whatever, that's the whole key right then and there. Um, and I can tell you by adhering to that logic and feeling very, very strongly about it, that the tuning of the system has to be vetted daily. Um, if, I, if I slash we, meaning with myself and the systems engineer, do this properly, I can have somebody out on a thrust uh, and doing absolutely nothing to the vocal to keep it from feeding back. Now 100%. there will still be some th there will still be some things I can't do. Some of that cool air EQ we mentioned, yes, maybe I can't get away with that anymore, you know. But it's it's kind of a game of survival then. But if you do it right, you don't have to do a ton of trickery. Now we just mentioned the things like PSE or the Need fifty forty five. We're already doing some trickery. So that to me that to me is the key is just to make sure your PA is the best it can be. That being said, I've got some guys that I work with that we don't do thrust. They don't like, like I would die. There is nothing that could make it work. It would just, it would not work. It's too cantankerous of a situation with their vocal technique. And, uh, or I could do it and the vocal would be so incredibly buried. That's another truth is totally. that I've also had to live with some people that I know what the realistic point of gain before feedback is. Totally. And I, and I have to live with the fact that their vocal is going to be a little lower than I would like it. Even though I or, want to tell every audi audience member there, I know no <laughs> one knows more than me. It's, no one knows yeah. more than me that it's too low right now. Or I too wish it making low. or making compromises in your mix in order for that vocal to work in your stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and then to answer your question quickly, because I know you do some cool stuff to help that vocal pop out. Mine's pretty generic within the mix. I kind of, I still build a mix from like rhythm section on up. And if I build my mix properly and I've got a strong enough vocal, I really can just plop it on top. I, I, and I believe in that. Some people are like, no, you've got to start from, I, to me, that's what works. And that's all I do. I will have a separate vocal bus sometimes from the music bus so that they do have the ability to pop up or not be subjected to the overall compression. Although, and you might agree with this, or at least have noticed, if it's the vocal that, that's driving that compression in the bus, it actually becomes even more seemingly louder. It but does. if the snares, if the snares getting it every time, then you know. So that's the most I'll do is separate separate out vocals from music en route to getting out of the desk. So you Next. don't you don't do uh, parallel compression or anything on vocals. I don't because I'm usually running that vocal because I don't do any trickery. Like there's no notch filtering in my vocals. There might be, I always have a vocal bust. You know what? Let me backtrack. I'm not that magic. There is. A, <laughs> Nobody is. Have, this is, not, no. it's not like, you know, that's what I think is no. so much fun. so funny about some people that yeah. go at us. They're like, what's the magic? Tell us what the magic is. And it's like, Dude, if you look, man, at, if you look on. at that, I challenge anyone, come up to me at a show, look at what I have. I promise you, if there is any, there's nothing, the vocal will look the same where they, wherever they were. But one thing I do is I'll have a, I do have a vocal bus and that bus is merely a pass through. Rarely do I color it in any way or do anything to it. But what I'll use it for is I'll use it for the parametric EQ on there. If there is a situation where I just absolutely have to notch something cool. where forget my whole theory that you shouldn't have to, you know, but then the other tool I use in the case that again, if we're in a really highly reverberant feedback prone area, the technique I use, the trick I do, I just don't turn the vocal up as loud. And it sucks. And I hate it. And then I go to the next show and hopefully I don't have to do that. That's just the truth. You That's know? interesting. You know, um, yeah. you know, another thing that you probably do that I do too is if I'm in a situation where it's like, oh my, I'm going to die today. It's going to be impossible. I'm, I've got a vocalist in front of the PA. I'm in a room that's yeah. got, you know, 13 seconds of reverb. You know what I mean? The, 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 uh, um, anyway, all, all the things that are wrong are happening in that day. Um, I actually, um, will not try, 
uh, to push the overall PA as loud. So like, uh, you know, if I'm mixing normally at like 102, Rock Show at, at 102, but today we're in that room that is just horrible, I might pull the show back to like 100 or 99 just to right. give me the headroom of the ability to push that vocal maybe a little bit more over the top of everything else that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and that, so I'm doing kind of the same thing that you're talking about. Tuck, you're talking about tucking the vocal. I'm talking about pushing the vocal, but turning everything else down. Which is super real too. And yeah. that absolutely works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's about turning your ego down too sometimes. Oh, man. Thing. Oh, yeah. Because you're, and particularly in live audio, so much of what we do is based on the physical and just the sense of, of excitement. And to have to turn that down to maybe do what's best for the client, that's sometimes right. you got to do, you know? Sometimes you have to. Um, and that's, that's, hard that's one of the things we should get into at a later date is talking about the ability to have the feeling of impact in your mix without volume um mm -hmm. so when i'm talking about something that we were just talking about where a day where i have to turn down a little bit in order to succeed um I believe there's still impact. And the reason there's still impact is because I've built that into the mix, regardless of volume. Mm -hmm. Volume and impact yes. are two totally different things. That's, important. That's a good one. So um, we'll definitely, definitely have to talk about that and maybe how you and I do that because that's, that's a skill too, right? Like building, mm -hmm. building a mix that mm -hmm. feels... Yeah, my favorite thing in the world, dude, is to show up at a festival where there's all kinds of uh, sound restrictions and it's measurement sound restriction, right? So yeah. they're measuring it and they're saying, okay, today it's a 98 dB LEQ, you know, over 10 minutes. And I watch a bunch of engineers show up and just go, you know, they're all bummed out about it, whatever. And and I show up and I go, okay, no problem, whatever, because... Because like you, I've built in my own mix a feel of impact where mm -hmm. I literally, I can watch the dude with the measuring tool looking at it, listening, looking at it and going, so, like my thing must be broken. Yeah, like what, right. You know what I mean? Because right. he's looking at the rest of, uh, you know, the other engineers of the day mixed at 98. I'm mixing at 98, but my 98 feels mm -hmm. like a 102 as opposed yes. to other guys feel like they're at 98 and there's, there's felt and there's measured and it's two totally different yeah. things. Um, so we definitely, you know, want to talk about that in the future, but um, yeah, sorry to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, yeah, you gave me a million ideas. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm very much into that yeah. conversation. Um, Cool. Um, my vocal uh, philosophy of late has been I've been using the midside um, band bus control thing with vocals quite a bit um, and had a bunch of success with that. Um, it's super subtle, but it kind of really helps. Um, so um, I won't go into the whole detail of it. If you want, there's a, a bunch of videos online about how to do mid-side um, vocal processing. But but quickly, it is uh, once I've done all of the my buses, they finally all end up in a band bus minus the vocal. So the last chain right before the master bus for me is band bus and vocal bus, two stereo buses. That band bus, I then uh, will put on a midside um, type of compressor like F6, for instance. Um, and that the key of that plugin is coming from uh, the vocal. And so um, I'll set a pretty narrow band around 1K, uh, set the compressor to midside. And what that means is, is it ducks like 3 dB of 1K and a couple of frequencies around it because the Q is a little bit bigger, only in the center of your mix. So that whenever the vocal is singing, um, 1K is getting ducked by 3 dB only in the center. It's not touching any of the outside of your mix. Um, and it's a super subtle thing, but if you go and you get it right and you pop it in and out, it will... I'm telling you, you will say, wow, this is really interesting how this is making my vocal pop. 
Um, especially when we're talking about a band uh, that has like three guitar players, uh, which is what something that we're going to discuss too. Cause I know you have a band that has three guitar players too. Um, mm-hmm. So making space for that vocal because those guitars and the vocal are all in sharing that same space. Um, like how do we make that happen so that whenever the vocal happens, it's, it's big. And when it's not happening, maybe fills back in. Um, so anyway, you know, that's the quick version, quick and dirty version, but go online. There's all kinds of videos online, I think on the wave site too, um, about how to do that. Uh, so I've been doing that a lot. I will say, yep. when you showed that to me, I saw you a few weeks ago, you were doing the Marin Morris thing. And I think you have it centered at, of course, the concept is, is, was not lost. I mean, I'm like, oh, right. Yeah, cool. Uh, but I was like, I would never think to do that, but I'm familiar with it. But where you had it centered around like 1K, at least on that day when I walked in there, I thought somewhere. And that's somewhere I wouldn't have thought to go. Interesting. Um, frequency wise. And then you played it for me. And you're right. It was only doing like what, like 3 dB, 4 dB. At least I know, I know it wasn't moving much. Not much. Uh, and it was pretty damn noticeable. You know, yeah. that's just one that's kind of like, uh-huh, moments you have with with someone once you really would like like when you start doing this you know totally man it's like you know you you um that's what i love about kind of what we're doing too because like i said i'm learning along with the rest of you guys out there you know mm-hmm. maybe the way that chris does something is totally different than the way that i do it um and what's so rad about this is when we can finally go back into the zombie apocalypse um <laughs> we can uh uh, you know, all the things I'm going to go try are going to be tons. You know, I'm going to have a whole <laughs> list of things that I'm going to go say, oh, man, you know, I'm going to go try that. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, it works for me. Um, check it out. Um, but I don't do, you know, people ask me a lot about, do you do parallel compression with vocals? And um, I don't usually. In fact, it really. Not the, live. Yeah, it's not live. Idea. Um, At least well, I shouldn't say that. But for most of the people I work with, it would be a bad idea. Tell us why you think it would be a bad idea, because I think people need to Only, hear, hear it. Yeah, oh, sonically, for sure. And do I know if people are getting away with it? I absolutely do, uh, because it's just going to just going to bring the noise floor up to just a dangerous level that just goes right back into what we're talking about. It's either going to feedback or it's going to trash your mix because you're just going to pull all that shit up that's lying there on the floor, and suddenly that's now going to be even if that's tucked way back. It's, yep. it's part of the picture. Now. You're basically turning an expander on um, for mm-hmm. when the, the signal is missing. You have this huge expander that's happening um, mm-hmm. and it is a little bit dangerous. Um, now, if you have someone that just murders a microphone and they're behind the PA, I'm sure there's people listening right now. And this is to our point how cool it is that are going bullshit. I do it every day and it's awesome. Totally. You could... If you had enough level in the right environment, you could get away with this. No I problem. totally agree. And yeah. and actually, it may be helping them to succeed. You know, I mean, I, yes. I don't want to say, yeah. you know, don't do this, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, what the fuck do I know? I, you know, I, I right. Yeah, yeah, if yeah, it I'm works you. for you, I'm if it you. works for you, then cool. You know, um, I'm just saying from yeah. my own experience, um, I've tried parallel compression on vocals and don't really like it. In fact, I'm not really a parallel compression on anything but drums. Do you do guitars yeah. or bass or anything? Yeah, it's weird. I've tried it on guitars. I like it during the moment of playback and experimentation. Come showtime, it's too much. Then I want to parallel everything. I will with Bruno because it, you know it's R&B and yep. it's keys and rhythm section. And yep. to get, I've never... Uh, I've had to learn early on. I didn't mix a lot of that stuff where keys, keys, synths, th- this is what matters the most. Even if yeah. I was listening to it, mixing wise, I wasn't. So I've had to, find, I have a parallel keys bus huh. on, uh, on Bruno. It's super low and it's set in a very traditional, ideally with parallel compression, you know, it's to raise the RMS level of your existing signal when the whole, that's the whole thing is you keep your peaks. In doing that, the way that it was imagined originally is you would use a really fast attack, a slower release. So you're, you know, yeah, what a keeping lot of your RMS. Started, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, what a lot of us has started to do, myself included, is like that second bus is oftentimes, that's why I'll have a two and three going back to our earlier video. Yeah. One will be a kind of squished, distorted 
bar of power. The other thing is a DCA based compressor with a slow ass attack. So this attacks even coinier, you know, it's this, this other psycho that's hanging out with its more stable brother. I love uh, but it. For my keys, for my keys, <laughs> for my keys, I do it in a more traditional sense. Like that keys thing is EQ'd heavily and it's fast attack, slow release. So it's just to push it up. Interesting. Um, speaking of tangents, that's the only time I, I ever do it. I've never even tried it live because I believe so strongly in the fact that I can't spare the noise for it. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it is something that you definitely yeah. have to think about. Um, also, you know, gain structure is like what it's all about with a vocal because of what you're describing. If you if you gain mm -hmm. a vocal, <clears throat> if you over gain a vocal, and then all of a sudden you add, you know, six plugins in a row that are all putting gain into this, or six hardware units that are putting gain into mm -hmm. this, the <clears throat> the top input in your mix is now all of a sudden this thing that just sits there and goes shh you know yeah what, oh yeah like yeah. when the band stops during sound check your whole pa is just going you know just it's sitting there hazer. yeah oh um, yeah it's like part it's a party trick of mine for people that come to my shows i'm like watch this and i'll turn the the knee for the PSU knee out. Off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah that's um, awesome um, that in my drum but when i unmute my drum vca bus it hisses like crazy because yeah. i have so much HF boosted and p distortion and all kinds of other shit. I know. You know? Well, it's funny, you know, I've ha actually had people that have like come to uh, a, a rehearsal or whatever or come to and they're like, wow, <laughs> what's that's that noise? What's that noise? And I always <laughs> go, yeah, but no one in a show ever hears uh -huh. it like you're hearing it right uh -huh. now. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like nobody ever hears it like this. Like even yeah. in between songs, everyone in the audience is making noise. Like nobody's hearing what you're hearing right now. Yep. Um, and so that's cool. In live, we can kind of get away with that shit. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, cool. Um, anything else before we kind of wrap this up about vocals in particular you want to talk about? One last thing I wanted to say is it's important that we remember, you know, a live show is, is servicing their existing fan base, you know, um, who – those are the diehards, but it also can be introducing that artist to someone new. And my point here is to be a lot of times, if you know, if you work for the artist, clearly, you know, the songs, so you're not, you're hearing the words without hearing the words, you know, the song, yeah. you know, the parts. And a lot of times vocals can get buried or smothered in effects. And I think it's a lot of times done with everyone here knows what they're saying anyway, plus, I'm kind of listening, but I know what there's, there's somebody that's never heard those words before. There's somebody there. Like I, I will have too dry of a vocal often because I guarantee you, you can understand totally. everything that's being said. I'm the same and I way. think that, so I'm not, I'm not, and now I'm not making an argument for not using as much effects and being as creative as you can, but I am making an argument for really be mindful that not everybody knows what the hell they're saying or by default, you know, I think way more important than, any or the most important thing with a vocal is intelligibility, right? Mm -hmm. So it, getting every little nuance that happens in that vocal while the music is happening and while it's not happening. And so mm -hmm. the making that happen is a real skill that you should try to work on. Um, and I am exactly the same way, dude. I, I use effects in general on vocals are super subtle in general. And only there if it's part of what the sound of the song is, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, mm -hmm. if it's a super chorused, flanged out vocal for that song, then obviously that has to be there, right? Because people will recognize that that's not there. They'll say, oh, it's a really dry version of it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So when that happens, you have to come up with a way to you know, make that happen. But I I'm telling you, man, you listen to all my board mixes and they're – Every I spend a lot of time making sure that any effect is out of the way of a vocal. It's not clouding any sort of intelligibility. So that's a, it's a really good point that you bring up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool, man. Yeah, man. Um, uh, and we, you know, by the way, um, we um, shot a video which I haven't posted. 
um, which will probably get posted before this video, um, that we spoke a lot about reverbs and what we do to uh, kind of get reverbs out of the way. Um, and and so check that out because that that relates to vocal too, like you know, absolutely what the things that we do to uh, to get that stuff out of the way. Um, so, all right, man. Well, hey, listen, this has been a lot of fun talking about vocals, and uh, appreciate you uh, you uh, spending your time with me. It's um, you know we're getting a lot of feedback. People are really enjoying it. Um, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Don't forget to go to at uh, Chris Raybold on Instagram and Facebook. Um, here's the splash screen for all my social media stuff. Um, if you guys keep watching these and you want some more, you know, Chris and I have talked a lot about maybe doing some live events uh, when we're able to go back outside um, where it's him and I, you know, in front of a console and a bunch of you uh, coming and joining us. Uh, in a real situation as opposed to the web version of this. Um, if you guys are interested in that, you know, tell your friends to come and check this out. The more people that we get interested in this, the more it will kind of push us towards that. So um, thanks a lot for tuning in and uh, we hope you keep watching our videos. All right, talk to you later. See you everybody.